into the center of town to support vitality here. It could also be a place for cultural and community space. And there's also still a lot of support for it being a jobs producing uh, and economic driver 
uh, for the town of Clinton as well. Ideas of education and training, but also bringing some new open spaces into the center of Clinton. So all of these ideas are incorporated into uh, the scenarios that we developed. Other ideas, <coughs> excuse me, which could be included and would be a benefit to the town of Clinton at the center of town would be to realign some of the streets for better connections and connectivity, to create more additional sidewalks than already exist in some of the places, and create some walking paths that would connect some of the destinations in town, and create better connections to the railroad station, which is at the center of the study room. And that generally, this should be a site which contributes to the town of Clinton at its center. Uh, currently, it's vacant. It was a long history of being an economic driver of jobs producing the site. But really, uh, it's about creating a game changer in Clinton. It's a large amount of land, has great potential, uh, and I think that this process and hopefully the, some of the steps that Clinton can take in the future will open up the eyes of, of uh, both residents and uh, potential uh, development entities to look at the property in a new way. So this was the preferred concept approach, which was the result of uh, a series of conceptual alternatives which we prepared and reviewed with the steering committee. They explored uh, both sort of the site layout, but also the development program, the amount of density that we're trying to get on the site, uh, residential uses, how much uh, of the existing facilities and buildings could be reused. Uh, we have a market economist uh, also on the team, FXM Associates, who looked at these development scenarios, uh, ran some numbers, uh, they're uh, basically very sort of conceptual performance, which take into account development costs and the potential revenue that they could get in a project like this. And it's uh, it's in the, not a home run at this point with the market considerations, but it's in the realm of possibility that something like this uh, could be relatively realistic. What we're looking at uh, in terms of the development program in a depiction such as this, approximately 250 housing units, about 30,000 square feet of office or manufacturing space, which are made with the Art Deco building of the unit of property, about 20,000 square foot of ground floor retail space, which would help to activate the main street, and then a surface parking built into the site plan, which could support all of those uses. Here are a few other views of this type of use, which could contribute to uh, vitality and walkability of the town center, just north of the train station. So just as a point of reference, this is the existing train station here. It's actually shown uh, with some of the improvements, which would be potentially similar to the Guilford station. Uh, Condot has a plan for that, uh, which I guess is, is sort of back, back in alignment after maybe being delayed. Um, and then the surrounding residential neighborhoods uh, that are there today. Similarly, another view from above, a view back across from the high street. And much of the wooded area and interior of the site with the small pond is in the tidal wetlands. It's retained at the north of that block. Another view just above West Main Street looking back north. But that's owned. Um that's private These, so one thing I should explain is that nearly all of the land within this study is privately owned by Unilever or others. And what we're looking at is trying to set the groundwork so that those private ownership patterns that are there today have more opportunities in the future. So that what we found is the, the large amount of square footage and space that Unilever has, for example, is not likely to be filled by a single manufacturing tenant like was there previously with Unilever's um, cosmetics facilities. So the, the ideas that exist in this diagram, which I'll we'll go to in a little more detail, can't happen today because of the existing zoning restrictions and the existing um, use restrictions on the properties that are there. So this is a hypothetical, imaginary scenario that we've created, looking at a longer term future, to think about what are the roadblocks between today and that future that we want to open the doors for. And this, this process today 
has been well supported by the conversations that we've been having in the community. It's not to say that it, would, it will happen. It, it may not, it may not happen. We, we could potentially do all of these things to open the doors, and still the market would not come forward and produce results similar to this. Um, I, I guess I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but the diagrams that we're showing are, are here to both test ideas, but also potentially to excite or, or even uh, raise some issues that we want to get in front of. But the idea is, we, have, we don't know. This is a shot in the dark about what something could look like in the future. It's just funny because it's, yeah. it's her bond. It's her bond. Yeah. Well, this, this drawing actually, it's hard to see on a vision like this. We'll have a few more images which show the parcel lines. All of this development is actually occurring within the Unilever parcel lines. So the area to the north of it, which is the pond in those areas, is shown in this depiction as conservation. Okay. I think her specific question is those white houses that are shown there. You're, you're, nothing that you've proposed to demolish and live in the eight white houses. These houses here? Yeah. Those are existing homes. And you're not proposing that they be raised, acquired, or anything? Nope. Okay. Or any of the ones on this. Okay. No, no, all the, the existing homes that are there today are still there in these drawings. The existing homes and their uh, property lines are not encroached upon by these drawings. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about as a strong element of the standards and guidelines that we think come out of a solution like this are the idea that there should be a strong buffer between existing homes and property lines and any future development such that there's a wooded area there that you can't necessarily see any of this work. And that's what we're showing here with, this is a, you know existing wooded area. And we've tried to develop in such a way that's concentrated, clustered development that is set within that existing woods so that there's both respect to the existing scale of the residential neighborhood and respect to those views that occur in the existing. So the core ideas which are, are uh, embodied in this conceptual approach, and so we try to get relatively specific to test the feasibility, but then within this concept, conceptual approach to the future, uh, back out of it ideas that we think both resonate with what the community has told us and make sense from a market perspective and an overall town perspective of supporting the industry. So this is the, the core idea of this, this plan that we're showing is that you have at its center a mixed use activity core. And we've been relatively flexible and we continue with any standards of zoning to be flexible about the uses that would actually uh, potentially fill this space. We're showing a, a combination of retail and residential uses, offices and the existing office building, uh, the 1929 Art Deco building of the Ponds facility uh, retained in, in backfill this community space or uh, manufacturing and technical space. Uh, but basically, having a mix of uses which fill in that space, which are uh, disposed in sort of a campus setting that reinforce walkable connections between each of those buildings and facilities. And that would be a higher density core, which is very near to the station, which is consistent with uh, transit-oriented planning and ideas which reinforce the transit as an amenity and investment in the community. And also attract higher rents in the future, potentially, from people that are located so closely to the station and can get to other cities as commuters. As we move north and more near the residential uh, portions of the community that exist today, we recommend stepping that density down and having more townhouse uh, or single family home type development that really fits into the fabric of the neighborhood that's there today and respects the, the historic homes and the patterns of uses. As part of this plan, we're thinking about and recommending that there be uh, some standards about linked open spaces, that the buildings would be disposed to frame open spaces and be oriented to streets as well, and that those open spaces would be linked as pedestrian routes and paths. 
one of those open spaces that we're showing to the north is proposed as an idea of a conservation area. Uh, it's mostly uh, wetland and tidal wetland today, uh, and that it could be um, retained that way over time as, as a memory. And then looking at uh, ideas of improving connectivity and connections in the uh, study area, there are a few connections which make a lot of sense. This is the existing access way out of the back loading area of the Unilever factory today, expanding that and potentially regrading it somewhat with the development so that it's a, a true uh, connecting street, potentially bringing a connection here to North High Street, where you the West Main Street underpass, over to John Street to make some of those redundant connections which don't exist today, which could help people have choices as they move around. Uh, the pinch points of the two other passes would certainly remain pinch points in the future. Uh, and then looking at building up a little bit more of a, a street network with a block system, which would give more choices and opportunity for street frontage for new development as well. The dashed lines are ideas for improving pedestrian connections and making sure that all of the areas that are within walking distance of the train station have a better opportunity to get to the train station instead of today potentially having to go down to West Main Street and back and up or all the way around or who knows, but making sure that there's sidewalk connections which uh, start to get people across that large expanse of land in the center. So from, from all of that, we're trying to learn some lessons as I suggested. So here, here are a few of the key uh, ideas which come out of that in terms of the Unilever buildings themselves. Uh, and what we're looking at is this will dovetail into the implementation recommendations with historic districts, village districts, and such. That within this scheme, what we're showing and retaining of the Unilever uh, buildings is a pretty uh, small chunk, which is the 1929 original Art Deco building of the Ponds factory. And that's a historic structure, um, and that would be a center point to future development. Uh, additionally, the existing office building would be retained uh, because it's in fine shape. It can be leased relatively easily uh, and it wouldn't require too much work. Uh, so that would be a part of uh, future development plans as well. So those two are core pieces. Uh, what we've labeled as three here could potentially be edited or reduced as is necessary with the future tenant. M much of that manufacturing space uh, could be filled if there's someone to fill it, or it could be reduced to make more room on the site for some other uses like we've shown. Uh, and then there are some other um, existing portions of the facilities like some of the tank farms and utility work and outbuildings that are on the the west side of the site and the north side of the site that uh, under mostly any circumstance we would foresee could be removed and cleaned up as a part of environmental remediation uh, which could occur on the side. Here's a, uh, we've acquired some of the floor plans of the buildings just to look at the feasibility of what I just described and the, the buildings have in fact been built out over time as the needs for the manufacturing processes have occurred. Uh, so. Uh, just as they were additive in nature, you know, the original 1929 structure, floor space, additional floor space, uh, it can be subtracted uh, in much the same way that it was added on to, taking it back to column lines and structural grids as it makes sense. So that type of uh, approach, which, which I described in an earlier slide, is entirely achievable from our architectural and structural perspective. In terms of preservation, uh, what I just described about the, the uh, odds building is, is very important and true, and I think as a gateway into the town of Clinton and its view as you come and you turn onto Central Avenue is very important as a feature in the, in the town. And then the High Street historic homes in the, the district there is very important as a, as a feature to the town of Gateway, uh, which is part of the idea with the historic district that Todd was talking about. As the, Measure. And then the idea that uh, at the center of this block, the wooded area is, is very important as a natural feature uh, in 
know, shouldn't be, I, I think there would have to be some uh, pretty uh, interesting ways to figure out how to develop it anyway, because much of it's wetland. But uh, that would be a critical idea. And then uh, built into this site plan, uh, I've mentioned some of them, but the ideas of building clusters which are tightly uh, located together, so you're minimizing the impact uh, on the neighborhood and the, the, wood, the wooded area, and then also uh, clustered in such a way that sewage treatment is uh, feasible and more possible. Uh, you're putting together an approved pedestrian network and then you're integrating parking in as much as possible. And the idea that this entire uh, concept has very strong buffers to all the existing neighbors and is adding vitality to the area. So here, here is really the so all of that, whether whether you agree or disagree with the way it looks or some details of it, um, these are the conclusions from all of that thinking, which are really the next steps uh, for the town. Uh, these these conclusions for the town, in a way, step back from the detail that we just looked at. Uh, we're trying to open up as many possibilities as possible. Uh, increase the number of future opportunities that are there today. Um, so we're not being overly prescriptive about what should occur or how it should occur. So uh, these illustrations are really just what we saw are means to get us to this point. <coughs> so here's the existing zoning context today. In all of the, uh, and you can see a little bit better just as a note, the property lines uh, the existing Unilever factory and facilities are in the industrial one uh, use district today, as are some of the surrounding residential houses. Uh, the idea would be that there would be a new underlying zoning district which could replace the I-1 district. We've referred to it as an MU district, a mixed use development district. Um, the, the main difference from the existing zone that's there today is that residential uses would be allowed. Uh, residential uses today are prohibited. Uh, the dimensional characteristics of the I-1 district, uh, which I believe I have here, uh, would not change dramatically, or well, actually, I should say would not change at all. Uh, we think that the characteristics which are there today, which are a maximum building height of four stories, 55 feet, that's consistent with the types of depictions that we've shown uh, and I don't think would limit development potential in any way. So it's the same uh, dimensional characteristics. We would recommend that industrial uses still be allowed to not limit that as a use either for the potential use of the uh, Unilever factory. Uh, and that the big change is opening the door for the type of mixed use or residential development that we show in our illustration. Coupled with that underlying zoning change, we uh, would also recommend that two village zones be created, uh, village district zones. That there is one village zone today in existence in Clinton at the Main Street, uh, just at the town of Green. Um, and what it allows within Connecticut is the addition of design standards to be applied to a, a defined geography. Uh, and in this case, we would recommend that there be a village district which would match that uh, I-1 transitioning to an MU district in the zoning. Uh, and then also a second proposed village district which would be coupled with the historic district boundaries which Todd will talk about because the historic district boundary is a recognition uh, of the history of the place and opens some opportunities for tax credits, but it's not necessarily a tool for Preserve, you know, there's no, uh, I guess, restrictions associated right. with it. Yeah, no restrictions. And what I told the district would want to do is a time. So that is a is a layer of additional, um, both design standards and potential design review. That first district would would continue to be a part of the idea of a mixed use, uh, walkable, oriented district that contributes to the vitality and connectivity of the train station area and the main street. 
So these are the of that district, the, the main uh, tenants and purpose, reinforcing the idea that permitted uses uh, are there to encourage mixed uses, residential uses, uh, that multifamily residential uses are allowed to right, uh, and that would help to reinforce the uh, transit-oriented nature of redevelopment there. And that overall looking at a parking minimum reduction uh, the town of Clinton has parking minimums, which um, may be higher than someone in this context would want to build because they are looking at the potential for residents to both walk and commute by train to other uh, places for work. Um, so they may have uh, a reason to reduce parking. If they don't want to reduce parking, there's nothing that says that they don't have, they don't have to. Uh, but you're not requiring them to build parking that they don't want uh, as a basic idea to uh, enhance development potential. And then along with that, we get to uh, adding some design standards as part of the village zone. And those would be to uh, basically be compatible with the historic structures that are, are nearby. Uh, that the architectural character would be to reinforce the village setting of the town of Clinton, which is very strong, and especially on a beautiful summer night like tonight. That we want to cluster higher density uses near the station itself, and then taper as we get toward the existing residential neighborhood. And then we're really wanting to create a setback a buffer. Um, I think in the report we set it at 50 feet. We can talk about how big that buffer should be. Um, but that we're really looking at components of traditional neighborhoods where you have walkable streets, buildings that are oriented to the street, parking that's in the rear to the side of buildings. So we're really trying to create a very vibrant and friendly district that will be uh, a contributor to the Clinton character that's here today. The second village zone uh, is uh, a lot more limited in scope than the first village zone. Its idea is basically to add some standard and design review to the historic district, which is proposed. Uh, the permitted uses, dimensional characteristics, park room permits, none of that has changed. The sole purpose of this uh, district would be to establish uh, some simple design standards for preservation, uh, and that would basically be to preserve defined historic structures, uh, and the historic structures are defined as those that are either uh, individually contributing, individually the, the, the contributing structures to the district. Contributing structures to the district or individually eligible structures in the district. Right. Well, well, once, once the district is, is established, and uh, then everything is, everything is there. Okay. So it would be, and there's some properties which you'll see on a map in a few uh, <coughs> slides that don't fall in that category, so uh, they won't be required. And then looking at uh, just basic uh, street character and landscape, uh, you saw in the, the report there was a beautiful historic photograph down High Street with some of the street trees and the historic character of the street as it was back in the day. Uh, and reinforcing that character uh, as it moves forward into the future is very important. The historic district, which uh, um, Maybe I'll, I'll let Todd speak for a little bit, but its boundaries uh, basically mimic those boundaries that I have just discussed, except for I believe the zoning uh, did include these areas today, so that's a difference. And I will say actually, too, before Todd steps up, in the appendix of the report, as part of this process, we prepared, Todd has prepared, a draft uh, application for a National Register of Historic Places for the High Street District. Um, and that is, a, is an important, as we get into implementation actions, an next, important next step. Uh, but I'll let Todd just speak about the district a little bit now. Great. So uh, my job is basically to, uh, I, I, as uh, some of you may know, I was on the team that did the most recent historic resource inventory. Uh, here in Clinton, and it covered basically the same area. So it was, uh, you know, not a long step 
to write to write this national register nomination. Um, it includes uh, nearly every house on High and John Street. This little house on Central Avenue. The uh, the ponds, the former ponds factory, and, un and unfortunately, we couldn't because of the of the requirements of the national of the, of the National Park Service and the way these districts are written, we couldn't figure out how to include the uh, homes, the historic homes on North High Street, even though there's some really great ones there. There's just too much info. Um, there may be another way to do it, but we couldn't get it into this district. So what you have here is a really coherent district of historic houses. Uh, we we had the, we set the uh, period of significance, which is the period of uh, uh, the, the, the period of time during which buildings in this area were uh, were built for the most part uh, from 1710 to 1958. So there was a lot of territory. From close to the beginnings of Clinton, anyway, to uh, to the uh, to the construction of the last section of the Vinoy. And one of the reasons that we did it that way was that we wanted to make as many of these houses and buildings as possible eligible for tax credits. Um, and I think that there are there are very few non-contributing buildings here. That a non-contributing building would, would uh, be something that either was less than 50 years old, or which was older than that, but had been had such horrible things done with it that you couldn't tell what it was. Uh, they're not too. I don't think there's any of those. So there's one, there's one or two. Um, but for the most part, this is a terrific, coherent, clear district, which you should all be proud of. Really nicely done, um, and it is defined by two major things, which is the turnpike, which was, which is what made High Street High Street, and um, the uh, the ponds factory, and those are the two things that really get it to come together as a district. Uh, the, the turnpike, the, the turnpike history, because if you if you read this, and if, if you guys have it up on your own website, or is it on It'll be a part of the PDF that gets uploaded. Okay. Go ahead. I'm thinking of the Hartford Turnpike, the road up to Clinton, Mr. Kelly, not the Medicare. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> the, the 18, whatever, 1833 Turnpike. 1813. I'm talking about the, eight, you know, historians kind of, you know, get involved in their project. Yeah. So, you know, turnpike to me, the only, as far as, I mean, when I talk about this area, the only turnpike I think of is one yeah. of the 1830. This is the Kelly, this is the one that went to the Connecticut River. Yeah. Pardon me? The other turnpike defines the other one. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it does, actually, absolutely. It, it defines the other end of the district that says, you know, it's, it's not historic anymore. It's, it's what it said. But it, the, the history of that turnpike was actually very interesting. It's one of the very earliest ones. And um, typically, they just, the, the, the state gave out these turnpike patents. These were, these were right for a company to, uh, to, to, maintain, to build and maintain a road and charge tolls on. And uh, the state of Connecticut, by using an English model, the turnpike uh, model, figured that they could get an awful lot of roads improved really quickly and not have to pay for it if all they did was give out these turnpike patents. And they gave out a lot of them, and nearly all of them were used. Most, however, were just on moral, you know, they would take uh, existing roads and improve. And I think that's mostly what happened here. Uh, they improved a little bit, they built a few roads. But uh, it, it ran for, I, I, I'd have to find it here to tell you exactly when it stopped. But uh, 1850, from 1830, 1813 to 1850, that road uh, functioned as a turnpike. And houses started to be built. There were one or two scattered farmhouses there, but houses started to be built as the turnpike was built. And 
and they slowly, you could walk from one end of High Street to the other, and if you know what you're looking at, and if you read this, you will, um, you can tell, you know, when there were periods of prosperity, you can tell, you know, when there were wars or periods of uh, economic drought, because there were no houses built at that time, and then they'd start up again when things got better. So that's what's going on here. Any, 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 and I'm going to turn to the desk really. Anything that's, uh, any, any uh, contributing building, houses or the factory. The factory, but there's, this different. Any contributing house will be eligible next week, July 1st, 2015, 20, no, uh, July 1st next year, July 1st, 2015, for uh, historic homeowner tax credit. Before that, there was a geographical restriction. We thought we had the all geographical restrictions removed. It didn't quite work out that way. Uh, it was, but 30% of five million dollars is available for uh, historic homeowners. That's good for 30% of the hard costs of rehabilitation. I'm sorry. Could you do that again? Sure. Um, the short story is that. Uh, as of July 1st, 2015, uh, homeowners in this district or any other historic home in Clinton or in the rest of the state will be eligible for historic homeowner tax credits. And that translates to 20 to 30 percent of the cost of labor and materials to do work on your house. A, min a minimum of $15,000, which as we all know is pretty easy to get to. So that's one of the advantages of being listed. There are no other restrictions to being listed in the National Register. None. Is that a question? Uh, in, in the building, the, uh, the uh, factory is eligible for state and uh, federal historic rehabilitation tax credits. That's only for uh, income producing projects. Thank you. And as as our uh, just to highlight the point about historic tax credits, the importance in creating an opportunity for those for the future of the district and the way that this is looking to us uh, is that the uh, results of the perform analysis were right at the edge. So if a developer could have the potential to use historic tax credits, then their feasibility might improve financially, which might make the opportunity uh, more plausible uh, in the coming years. But how does sure. how do you do a historic district? Yeah. How do you build something new in a historic district? The historic tax credits are available to renovations of historic properties that meet certain historic standards. New construction would not be eligible for those count. tax credits anymore. So it wouldn't count. Right. No. So new construction would uh, it would be a part potentially of the same development in this case where they're renovating the Art Deco building of the Ponds facility mm -hmm. with historic tax credits, which would make that piece really go. But that's the, that's the other piece of the community you know, piece that we right. have. Anyway. Right, but then it would also make the new construction more feasible because it makes that That's work. a little part of it. Because you, they would be, you know, not theoretically eligible for a nominal 45 percent of the equity that they put in there. So that's that's a big chunk. That makes your performance a whole lot better. And the, the new the new building conform to the design standards for the district. That would be controlling that, right? Right. Right. And the new so the new construction would then be guided by the standards that we talked about in the village zone, so that you don't end up with pieces that don't work together, that we're really trying to build things that are compatible with existing residents, with the uh, existing buildings, and then really creating quite a few benefits uh, for Clinton and the district. And then some of them being the idea that I've talked about a few times now, transit-oriented uh, development, which is very strong in the Northeast and in New England, uh, with the Clinton Station here uh, with access to New Haven, New London. Um, that is very strong draw for people who might want to locate here and work in another town 
who would want, then want to be very close to it, could walk to it, hop on the train, get to a job, uh, which is a market uh, in terms of residents that isn't necessarily served by Clinton currently. So that's another reason why this type of idea may make sense to someone in the future, is that you're opening up a new sort of market which might be uh, more renters, more than the owners that are there today. Uh, it's hard to tell the demographics. Uh, but one of the things that FXM showed, uh, we did sort of two ends of an analysis. One that looked at the cost of construction and the required rents that would be needed to make that cost of construction work. And they were, you know, in the neighborhood of $2,000 a month for rent. Uh, FXM did a residential, um, their own residential housing model, which looks at demographics, the market of, of Clinton in relation to other uh, neighboring cities and towns, and the type of people that might be attracted to Clinton uh, in the types of rents that they may pay. And the upper end of their range was around $1,800. So it's actually pretty close, much closer than we thought it may, may be. Um, so that's that's promising in this regard. And it can work in the other direction too. If there's a, if there's a use in that in, in the form of Ponce facility, that might draw someone, you know, might draw people from Providence or from right. New Haven. That <coughs> transit, you know, the fact that it's right there next to the train is good. It's, it's it works in both directions. I do see it working that way, but I don't see how you don't want to have people living right next to the train station. The oh, train it's, it's all over the place. Yeah, the train train for, for it's the hottest thing in Connecticut. Yeah, I've seen three projects. Right. It can be great because you listen to the noise of the train. You get used to it. <laughs> you really do. No, I've, I've used that in there for years. Well, how old is the oldest <laughs> house considered in this historic district? Well, there's one that's, that's, our, there's one that's, uh, that's uh, we, I mean, I mean, really when you're saying historic, how old is the oldest? 1710. Yes, yeah, so that one? No. And that was moved, but it was moved to that location. The yeah, oldest one yeah. that's, that was built there, uh, 1700 was moved. The oldest one is 60 High Street, 1710. But that's um, down the street from us. Yeah, I'm 70 and that's Sean. Because it was the house that, that was on historic and that records was, board in Eleanor Roosevelt, but stayed there. Really? I think it was 1750. It burned down and it was rebuilt. Ah, well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But I just was wondering the oldest in this area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, 1710 is the oldest we could find as a nominal. I mean, we don't really go into the yeah. you know, no, deep wondering. research. But, and that house has obviously been yeah. changed considerably, yeah. but it still has. The salt box profile. Yeah. yeah. I mean, clearly yeah. they weren't using uh, fish bale shingles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, given all of this, uh, we put together is a, a dozen, dirty dozen list of uh, next steps, which are really viable next steps for the town of Clinton. Um, one thing that I mentioned, I think, in some of the conversations before we started tonight. But I don't know if I've mentioned in the public sessions that uh, we've tried to work with Unilever in this planning process um, and reached out to them. They, they've reached out to us, but we, we haven't had them at the table, so to speak. Uh, they've been a little standoffish, but understandably so, because their um, interests, as we've described in the steering committee and throughout this process, is that they are a manufacturing company uh, and that they're not necessarily concerned primarily about their real estate holdings, uh, such as their holdings in Clinton. Um, and in addition to that, the types of dynamics that they have at work um, could be benefited by this process with or without their participation. So it, it just doesn't play into their hands to be fully participatory at this point in time. So um, in other words, you can't go and say you want to buy a property from you, but they're not interested at this point. Someone could. Anybody could. Any, anyone could say that. The town could say that. The town could do things that um, they could do various things to try to get the property. The town isn't interested in that, um, nor is the town a development entity. Uh, what we're trying to do is create a fertile ground for development in the future to occur, which may attract other development uh, proponents to this. Part of 
Um, and that's one of the real things that we think could help actually create positive activity here in the future is by the town of Clinton taking first this process underway uh, and the report that we have put together now. Then taking some of these tangible steps uh, just to lay the groundwork. It's not very specific in terms of how the outcome will play out. Um, but that in and of itself could attract the attention of development performance who are looking up and down rail lines all across the Northeast for opportunities such as this to then go and approach Unilever themselves and start the process rolling that way, which is more likely than getting Unilever necessarily. It, will, it may happen over a long arc, but a shorter way to get positive activity to occur is to have a, another development proponent approach that. Josh, yes, I mentioned, we <clears throat> sent every document that we've had to Unilever, so they've not been unaware of what we're doing, and we've had, we've had, we've had a little public, a little publicity for this, and as I understand it in the last week, uh, there are one developer has actually already approached Unilever, and the second one, uh, the real estate agent called me today, and I sent them the stuff. So there's but what are you going to do about the traffic? So the traffic is a is a good question. That's one that we talked about a little bit before now too. Any development of this scale and scope would require traffic studies to understand the exact impacts that they would have on the surrounding street network, and then potentially traffic mitigations. Uh, some of which would be the improved street network that we're showing in our diagrams. There is none. There is none unless you take over property. Yes. Yeah, unless you well, take over property. Or no, property the, use, or the, the Unilever yeah. property fronts also on right? North High Street. You've got that one, but you've got the same bottom that's going under North High Street that you had going under from High Street. Same bottom. You have to go under a tiny bridge. <coughs> no, it's not a bad thing it is a terrible thing when you have too many cars hitting that bottleneck at the same time. It has happened at 4 o'clock for years in the new development. You couldn't get under it. And any time 95 backs up, you have it again. So people who live on High Street and live on John Street can't get out into to cross that bottleneck. You can't get out of the driveway. You can't get out of the driveway if you can't get onto the I think the, the specific traffic impacts would have to be understood as a part of a specific development proposal. And but don't you think you should know that before a developer gets down the next step? We can't, we can't know that. I, I, I think that we could hire a traffic engineer at decent expense to run traffic analysis on the hypothetical concepts that we've created. But okay. there there's nothing to say that future development would occur in that same manner. So I think that, um, I, I think it has to be a part of thinking about what the specific proposal that comes forward is, uh, and then working with that development proposal to make sure that they have appropriate traffic mitigation measures. Okay. And the other thing is, I mean, the whole idea of this development is that it's supposedly walkable, so you can walk from here downtown so that you know you, for the occasional trip or occasional shopping you won't have to get in your car you'll be able to walk downtown and going on at the same time as this study is the route one study we're actually looking at improvements to route one to uh, from well this is a joint study with Westbrook, Old Saybrook and Clinton to try to make improvements along the route one. The bridges are a really serious those narrow, that's a really serious problem. Yeah, oh, underpasses are a real problem. The idea is to try to get traffic. That A lot of traffic goes on 81 because they don't know where else to go to get into town. Because the only signage, we've been working on the state for I think almost four years now, to make the signage better at 145 and at the Hammonesset connector. So instead of coming down 81, people People just don't know. They see one, this one sign that says Clinton, and you know, this is a second minor sign. 
right. in fact, than 145. So people and just go that way, that area. and trucks go that way, mm -hmm. and then they can't make it under the bridge. And then they turn that way, <coughs> and I got back-ended by the rear That's a real problem. Yeah. Rear-ended yeah. by a truck. But yeah. we're yeah. looking at the Route 1 connections. And I've just been told that in Norwalk now, they, well, it, unfortunately, it's Amtrak in Norwalk, is actually widening underpasses. To me. You know, re they were rebuilding those underpasses. At some point, they're going to have to rebuild the MD, the yeah, 81 I, yeah. thing. I live you know, in Norwalk, and they are they are doing that, and they're doing it uh, with pretty much no regard to anything that they are doing. Another traffic dynamic, just to close out that topic that we discussed briefly at the beginning, was uh, the idea that a mixed-use development of this nature has a variety of traffic flows and dynamics. It's not a all gather at one time, point in time, and all release at one point in time like the Unilever facility was itself. So if you have businesses, retail shops, restaurants, residences, there will be traffic flow. There will be, as with any improvement <coughs> of this nature, more cars on the street than there are today. That's a reality. But the development itself will have to be put forward in such a way that it's resolving any issues to an appropriate level of service on the streets so that the, the delays are reasonable or negligible. So, and that's, it's just a level of detail that we can't know, but I think that this type of concept and approach misses some of the major uh, pulses of traffic that you might get with a fully reinvigorated manufacturer. Um, can we go back to the Unilever question of the discussion a little bit? I noticed in one, in one of your um, alternate concepts of the um, addendum that there was a concept one that had a lot more use of Unilever. I'm just curious. You said that, I think you said Unilever is dormant. I don't know, I don't know if there's any, been any activity where they're are they trying to sell it, they're trying to use this as a, it seems to me it would be kind of a home run if, if we were to have somebody come in. And use utilize the 200,000 square feet of manufacturing space and have a manufacturing base there and utilize a lot of revenue. Of course, it doesn't. It's a little contrary to the historical development of that particular area right there. But I don't, I don't see anything that you know indicates that that's been studied and, and if you only were proactive in it or that's a consideration. The lead company wanted it. Lead company. Lead company wanted it. They're marketing the space currently, so it's on the market. Yeah. The, uh, contact that we've spoken with primarily is uh, a real estate representative from Cushman Wakefield, which is representing their properties. Um, so they're actively marketing the spaces. Um, the what? interior of it is filled with equipment that no one wants to take <coughs> And out. they still have somebody who takes care and of it. And they, they have, have not made taken it out because of and the cost. The and that's one of the things. They don't want the building. From FXM and Associates, equipment. the market economists we've been working with, their opinion is it's <coughs> unlikely that they will find a tenant which would use all of that manufacturing space. Yes, it's too expensive. Um, there's just not, there's an abundance of old industrial space in the Northeast similar to this space, and there's not enough uh, companies and uses to yeah. backfill yeah. that space that's available. But, but it is close to, to the railroad, you know, the big ship. Yep. There's, there's characteristics to it which are it, it, it could be divided into two spaces, two spaces. Yeah. And it could be, and that, and I think that as we went through the diagrams of the architectural ideas about how much or how little of this existing space you could edit uh, would be dependent on finding an anchor, so to speak, an anchor manufacturing tech, uh, and then how much space they would need. Uh, and then if you remove the space that they don't need, then that creates other opportunities like we're thinking on the site and uh, surrounding So um, the, um, we don't preclude that, I guess, is that the difference? It's a lot of better. The um, environmental aspect is more serious from here from what I read from what I read pretty minor. There, the environmental aspect is uh, relatively minor at this point in the planning process because it's a major undertaking. Um, what we did as part of this process was work with Ty and Bond, who are an environmental engineer. Uh, and they basically took a look at the public records which are available uh, at DEP 
um, went through those records to see if they found any really red flags about unusual environmental circumstances. They did not. It was mostly typical for what they would expect from the history of the site that is at. Um, underground storage tanks, some ground contamination, things of that nature. Um, nothing that would lead us to believe that it would be an insurmountable hurdle for redevelopment. So at this point, that is a good enough for us to think that there's nothing that would stop a process such as this from that aspect. Mm -hmm. what about Certainly, there would need to be further study and remediation plan put forward uh, that would require more time, more effort, uh, and funding. There are some state programs which could, uh, which is actually one of the uh, implementation steps that we would recommend to the town, that the town could actually undertake and try to get into one of those state-run programs to then look at brownfield remediation in those detail on this. There is some substantial brownfield yeah. There is substantial? Yeah. yeah. So they didn't know it was very substantial. Grants. In, oh, in grants. For grants. I mean, there was a, one of the, a project in Norwalk which was a, really didn't have a lot of remediation, got a $500,000 brownfield grant. Now, uh, what about the fact that they covered over the wetland right before the wetland law went in? So the whole back of the parking lot is over wetlands. The wetland information that we found Just let it go. It does not indicate that there's right. wetland except for the freshwater pond, which is in that northern area, and then also a tidal wetland, which is north of the freshwater pond. So that, um, if I can find the map. It's on the wetlands map. So this area, yeah, and there's a wetlands map in the appendix. But this area is south. There were no uh, wetlands to look So let me just look at this list to make sure. I think we've covered most of them of these things already what we talked about. Uh, consideration of an IHZ overlay zone is one thing I didn't mention yet. It has a little bit of a write-up in the report. Um, an incentive housing zone is an affordable housing zone uh, that's through the state of Connecticut. The characteristics of this site, its location by transit, uh, its uh, idea for residential uses, those are all consistent with what an IHZ zone would uh, Put forward the differences. The IHC zone would require a higher density than the densities that we are showing in our illustrations. So that's something I think that the town should consider. Um, but it's not. It, it would require that being comfortable with a higher level of density, which I think might work at the train station. The benefit of the IHC zone again is that it would open the door for pre-development grants and funding, which could further entice developers to come and look at uh, this location. Um, but it's, it's a step that's concrete that the town of Clinton can take to set up an IHC. It doesn't mean that a developer needs to uh, follow along with incentive housing development, um, but it would just create a new opportunity that doesn't exist today. Um, yeah, which one of these things the town chooses to, to you know, the way they do the zoning, the way they do this sort of thing, it, it, it telegraphs to a developer what you want to have there. Right. But basically, you get what you're zoning for. When they see what you've created in terms of zoning, then they know, you know, they know what will be easy for them to build and they, they know what they'll be able to get financed. It's not... Um it's additive. So if the IHC zone is an overlay zone, so it could occur also along with the other village zones and the underlying zone change to a mixed-use development zone. So all of those things could occur together and would be, uh, would, as Todd suggests, would send a specific message. Uh, I would say continuation of communication and partnership as it's possible with owners, at least just keeping them aware of the town's activities as things like zoning uh, would potentially move forward or what is occurring. We talked about the brownfield funding uh, for the investigation of the site. And that's another way to invite, um, continue to invite attention and redevelopment opportunity because it's an unknown. And development entities prefer to have transparency and an understanding of what they're getting into. So the more information that the town can pursue and proceed with in terms of 
uh, brownfield investigation, the better. Uh, street and sidewalk infrastructure investments, a very successful uh, redevelopment technique by many towns uh, and cities is putting some investment into streetscape improvements, circulation improvements, and that can occur on the streets that are in the district today, uh, adding sidewalks to North High Street or you know, doing things that can be done within the public right of way today uh, that would dress up the study area and invite some new attention to the area that shows developers that the town is serious about making this uh, area a new investment area. The, the conservation area uh, that we thought about and talked about in our presentation here is private land today. It would have to be something that private owners are agreeable to and excited about, um, but it would, it would be one potential way to create a new open space resource in the town or at least conserve that land in the town um, in perpetuity, but again, that's it's an idea for privately owned land, so it can be, it can stop there. Um, then also, uh, throughout this process, I don't think it's disingenuous to say that we've heard a lot of support for the ideas that we put forward. And I think as the town of Clinton is, is moving forward with some of these implementation steps, that it's important to remember uh, that we're really trying to build a shared community vision, and shared community support for uh, positive investment here. So if things start to seem to drag on or, or take a little bit long uh, in terms of implementation steps, like a new zoning district, I think having a, having a broader uh, picture of, of what the opportunities are that we're thinking about is important to keep in mind. And then all of this, as Alan mentioned, everything that we're doing explicitly or just through the airwaves of what people have their, their ear to uh, is marketing outreach and advocacy for the town of Clinton. And it really does attract attention, whether it, you're seeking attention uh, directly or just through word of mouth people hear about what the town is doing. Uh, so all of this, uh, and as if you continue with limitation steps, any one of these will continue to garner the excitement of attention where development entities are talking to one another and to you. As all of this gets more, uh, uh, a little closer to reality, uh, it would be interesting and a good uh, benefit to think about expedited permitting measures that the town could set up, uh, potentially a planned unit development zone or some other mechanism where the site plan review is transparent and straightforward for this property um, or series of properties or within the mixed use development district. Um, and that, that would be something that the building department and planning zone could take on. And then finally, um, it could occur, you know, at any point, any of these steps, but uh, remaining an advocate with conduct for the train station improvements is important. I think it doesn't, it just helps everything else that's occurring. Um, it doesn't hinder anything that doesn't occur, uh, but having a nice station, like uh, is the case of Guilford, with dual platforms and a crossover, uh, it, it is just reflection of the momentum of the district. All of that working together, and in, in the report we've included uh, a bit of a, a more general time frame in terms of years about which ones are are maybe front front end, which ones are back end, and potentially a, a champion of each of those efforts. So with that, um, we would be glad to hear your thoughts tonight, and if you have other want to take the time and look at the materials, they'll be online uh, this week. You can download the report, it will be in the PDF format. Uh, and then please, I guess, we didn't specify this exactly, but maybe send comments to Alan. Or be good, yes. Send comments to Alan and then we'll get them. And we'll make sure that we are collecting and cataloging comments and then we'll be refining and integrating things into a final report. This is the draft. So thank you.